Welcome to Global Awareness Week 2023. Woo! The theme, as you will learn about later today, is a world on the move. And this will touch on the reality of our world today. Because today, more than ever, are people living in countries that they were not born in. That is my family's story as well. My parents immigrated to the States in 1993 from South Korea when I was just three years old with nothing but a few bags. It's part of the reason why I'm wearing this shirt that represents the flag, the Korean flag. So I grew up in Queens, New York, and I was amazed by the diversity of immigrants and the beauty of the cultures they brought with them to this country. In a little bit, our keynote speaker, Dr. Sam George, will bring us today's message about the gospel opportunities we have in a world that is on the move. But before we hear today's message, I want to share with you some of the opportunities that we have for the remainder of Global Awareness Week. If you go to grace.org GAW, you can find many events available to you at any of our campuses. Some of our physical campuses will be hosting potlucks with different partners, so you can register for those if you are local to the area. But for our online campus in particular, we will be hosting a Zoom event with Pastor Claire Sullivan of YWAM Thailand. She was actually right here on our online campus a few weeks ago, if you remember, sharing about her ministry to trafficked women in Thailand. Next Thursday on November 9th from 7 to 8 p.m. the Eastern Time Zone, Pastor Claire will be sharing with us more in depth about that ministry and the ways in which we can be praying and partnering with her in her ministry. Feel free to join us even if you're eating dinner or having dessert at the time. We would love to see you there. I also want to share with you a beautiful celebration that I got to be a part of this past week. Lexi has been a part of our online campus for the past year. And she, as she was going through the membership process, she made the decision to get baptized. And so last week, we got to celebrate her baptism together in Lexington. And it was so meaningful to hear her story and to be a part of that moment. So if you're watching Lexi, congratulations on your baptism. Before we continue in musical worship today, let's take a moment to pause and pray together for our Global Awareness Sunday. God, we thank you so much for this amazing and beautiful day where we get to sit and learn and hear about what you are doing all over the world. We thank you, Lord God, that you are God of everyone all over the world. We hope that you would stir our hearts for love, compassion, learning, for things, Lord God, that you are doing. I pray that these moments that we have where we get to hear your message today and the different global awareness events that we have would allow our hearts to be moved in different ways, to see how we can partner and care for and love people all over the world. And so would this week, would this Sunday be really meaningful to all of us? We thank you. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, those who have been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, telling the message only to Jews. Some of them, however, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them about the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all of their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So. For a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Lane 
te busco Toda hora espero em ti Revela-te a mim Conhecer-te eu quero mais Mais uma vez Eu te busco, te procuro, ó Deus No silêncio Da hora espero em ti Revela-te a mim Conhecer-te eu quero mais yeah. O Senhor te quero Quero ouvir tua voz Senhor te quero mais eu Quero tocar-te Tua face eu Seguindo para o alvo eu vou A coroa conquistar Vou lutando, nada pode me impedir Eu vou te seguir, conhecer-te eu quero muito mais Senhor te quero Welcome to Global Awareness Week. Over the next few days, we get to see some of God's kingdom-building work around the globe and through the ministry of our partners. This year, we have 12 partners from six nations serving in nine different ministries. And you have an opportunity to meet and interact with them this week. You can find the events schedule at grace.org slash GAW. And I just encourage you, don't be shy. Say hello, show up to an event, share a meal, We want to learn from them, and we want to welcome them warmly. Friends, this is Grace Chapel Super Bowl for missions. Welcome to Global Awareness Week 2023. We're a world on the move, and that is Global Awareness Week's theme for this year. We're going to hear stories from partners about how people on the move have changed and reshaped lives and ministries. Because the truth is, from the first church to today, The displacement and relocation of people groups has given rich opportunity for the gospel to spread and for the leadership of the church to diversify. That's what we're hoping to learn this week. How might we, through hospitality and generosity, through serving as Jesus' hands and feet, how are we going to get to share the love of Christ with our new neighbors? Our keynote speaker today is Dr. Sam George, director of the Global Diaspora Institute at Wheaton College and the Lausanne Catalyst for Diasporas. Sam is a scholar, pastor, researcher, always on the move. He's lived in five countries, he speaks five languages, and he travels around the globe. He not only researches human migration, he has actually lived among refugees and learned from them firsthand. Sam is a global expert on migration and diaspora peoples and ministries, but he's also distinguished himself as the husband of Mary and the father of two grown sons. We're honored to have Dr. Sam George bring a word from God to the people of God today. In keeping with the theme of this year's conference, A World on the Move, we're collecting an offering to help two of our partners who are directly responding to the needs created by migration. Jesus Savior Church in Kisinau, Moldova is led by Pastor Vitaly Fadula. Under his shepherding leadership, the doors of the church have been opened since the start of the war 
in Ukraine. Our offering will help defray some of their ongoing costs as they continue to welcome and host their Ukrainian neighbors. Closer to home, the Emanuel Gospel Center in Boston works with refugee and migrant resettlement in our own Commonwealth. Our partner, Sarah Blumenshine, assists and trains local churches like ours to develop mutual and fruitful relationships with our new neighbors. It's easy to give. You can give online at grace.org slash give, or you can give through our app. But please, please remember, this is a special offering gift, which is above and beyond your regular financial support of Grace Chapel. Thank you in advance for your generosity. So without further ado, let's take a moment to meet this year's visiting partners and hear a little bit about how they've seen a world on the move. สวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีครับ We're Lauren and Seth Vachana Wilson, and we've been Grace Chapel Global Partners since 2007. We live in Thailand, and we help Bible translators and missionaries who are learning languages in Southeast Asia, the Middle East, and globally. People are moving around nowadays more and more, and God is using this to make it easier for me to meet with minority language speakers and others involved in Bible translation, both in person and online. And in my work as a language and culture learning coach, I'm able to help missionaries come up with creative ways to learn the languages of groups who, up until now, have been more isolated from the good news about Jesus. I'm George Chavani Kamanil, and I'm Leela Chavani Kamanil. Thank you, Grace Chapel, for standing with us. The exciting things we are seeing in North India these days is more and more new generation believers coming from Hindu and Sikh and Muslim background coming for ministerial training. This year also, we witnessed an extraordinary number of young people applying to New Theological College. Thank you for standing with us and helping us. God bless you. We are Bill and Judy Long, and we live in Waltham. And we work with international students. The flow of international students coming into the Boston area is constant and large, and they are coming from all around the world. They come to organized events, and we encounter them in day-to-day -day activities. They are open to friendship and curious about this new place, and often curious about faith. There are many wonderful opportunities to help them explore. From Nepal, it's me, Kiran Sharma. Um, here is my wife, Deepika Sharma. And he is Yuan Sharma. Hello. And he is Amuli Sharma. He is five years old. Yuan and Amuli is one years old. So right now, I'm working as a principal in Nepal Evil Theological Seminary. Uh, it's in located in Kathmandu. Uh, so I have a vision to train young leaders, uh, emerging leaders, for the future ministry in Nepal and abroad. So continue to pray for the Ministry of Nepal Evangelical Theological Seminary, which is located in Kathmandu Valley. Uh, so we appreciate your prayer and your support. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jonathan Groves. I'm the president and co-founder of Global Partners in Peace and Development based out of Roanoke, Virginia. I am privileged this week to represent our national partners, Pastor Wasim and Lillian, who are faithfully serving urban refugees at Grace Church in Amman, Jordan. We have seen God on the move in the country of Jordan as millions of displaced persons have been on the move since the late 1940s. Nearly 80% of all refugees in Jordan live in urban areas like Amman. For the last 30 years, Grace Church has joined God in bringing help and hope to thousands of refugee families who are in desperate need of physical care as well as spiritual and emotional healing. Hello, Grace Chapel. My name is Sarah Blumenshine. I'm the Director of Intercultural Ministries at the Emanuel Gospel Center in Boston. I live in Salem, Massachusetts, and people are on the move. People are arriving every day from Haiti, from Central and South America. And what that means for me is I'm working with Haitian and Spanish-speaking pastors and ministry leaders who are deeply involved in supporting these new arrivals and are looking for additional supports. Hi, I'm Steve Hope with International Students Incorporated. My wife and I have worked for years with International Student Ministry in the Boston area. Um, what are some changes and things we've seen in, in, um, in people movements? There's been a lot. In the last 15 years, I've seen many more of the minority groups in the different countries, the truly unreached people um, all over the world that are here in our midst. We haven't seen any come to Christ, some have, but they're open for friendship and they're here. So 
There's a lot to do. Thank you so much. Hello, my name is Vitaly Vetula, and I am the senior pastor of Jesus Savior Church from Kishino, Moldova. It is a joy for me to be back with Christ Chapel, to be home. Jesus Savior Church, because of your love and prayers, became a home for so many refugees, a place where they heard the gospel, the good news, and God's love. May God bless, may God continue to protect our families, our countries, and bless His church and fans in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, my name is Claire Sullivan, and I am a missionary with YWAM Thailand, and I am serving in an eight-block slum called Rakta in Bangkok, and church planting in Bung Bong, young Thai pastor reaching migrants coming in from Myanmar, Laos, and Cambodia, and going south to Pattaya, nicknamed the prostitution mecca of the world, and that's a story in itself, but building relationships with veteran missionaries there and heads of NGOs and prayer walking and doing outreach on the streets. So I can't wait to see you and um, the GAW family of missionaries and all of Grace Chapel. So what do you say? We bring it on. Come Holy Spirit. And thank you and see you there. Hello, Grace Chapel. Uh, greetings to you from Bangalore, India. I am here this week. Uh, teaching at a seminary, and look forward to being with you in a couple of weeks. I'm really honored and humbled to be invited to uh, be part of the Global Awareness Week uh, at Grace Chapel, and want to share uh, with you this message, the first Christians scattering and gathering of the people of God worldwide. I want to look at this passage from the beginning of the church and draw some lessons a place where we were called Christians for the first time, the name that stuck with us ever since, and draw some lessons for the church in North America in the early 21st century. This is the passage that was read to us, and I've highlighted and color-coded few verses and few phrases and some places uh, that is mentioned in this passage, and want to together reflect with you and draw some implications for the church today. We are living in some truly unprecedented times in the history of Christianity. There has been a radical shift in the center of gravity of Christianity where Christians live. Most Christians now are in Africa, Latin America, and Asia. And this shift has significant implication for the church and mission engagement for the churches in North America. There is a church, there are Christians in every country of the world. This has not been the case uh, before. Gospel has truly reached the ends of the earth and is bouncing back from multiple edges and gaining new momentum and advances in our times. Mission is from everywhere to everywhere. Many, many countries have become mission sending force and together having huge implications for kingdom, uh, kingdom work around the world. So let's go back to the beginning of the church and understand what is happening here in this passage in Acts uh, so I go back to Acts chapter 2, where the church was born. We know the promise that was given by Jesus as he ascended to his disciples. Wait here. Holy Spirit will come upon you. You will receive power and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And soon afterwards, the believers had gathered and we see the coming of the Holy Spirit. And we see uh, the people had gathered from many, many, many nations. And so if you look at Acts chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, we see a list of names. And sometimes we can just gloss over it. And if you were to map all these places, and we find here is Jerusalem. And all these places are mentioned in those two, three verses in Acts chapter 2. The birth of the church. Disciples had gathered for the Feast of Pentecost from many nations. And we see they receiving the first sermon of the church. Peter stands up and preaches. Some 3,000 people are converted. And the church is born. And what happens to all these believers from all these places? They were the scattered Jews, diaspora Jews. And they went back to their respective places and established fellowship uh, of believers. So we see a scattered people. Since the exile, the Jewish people were all over the Middle East, Middle East, Asia Minor, and North Africa. And that is exactly where church took root. 
And then we see the gathering of God's people, spirit empowerment, and then once again scattered on God's mission and spread of the kingdom. So now we come to the church at Antioch. Where is Antioch? It is the modern city of Antakya. It is found in Syria. It was the third largest city of the region. The red dots there. We see uh, Alexandria and Jerusalem and Rome. And uh, uh, so Rome and Alexandria and Antioch was the largest city. Antioch is located somewhere here. And we also note a few other places here uh, that is significant in this story. Half a million people lived in Antioch. It was a large cosmopolitan city. It was the westernmost end of the Silk Road, all the way through which Nestorian Christianity and the monks traveled to China. It was a trade center, and it was a cent hub of the economy in the Mediterranean in the first century. It was a coastal city. It was progressive and it was prosperous. Many, many cultic and mystery religions, and it was highly pluralistic in nature. It was home to Syrians, Romans, Arabs, Greeks, Cappadocians, Persians, Parthians, Armenians. So very cosmopolitan, a thriving, tolerant, cosmopolitan city marked by its diversity, and now it is part of Turkey. It's a war torn region now. So we read of the church. It was the second center of Christianity after Jerusalem. The persecuted believers in the passage, we see that they traveled out. They came to cities like Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. Antioch was the city on the north. Phoenicia was by the coast of Mediterranean Ocean. And Cyprus was a little island in the eastern Mediterranean Sea. The Cyprus and Cyrene Christians in Antioch started sharing the gospel. The first set of migrants who arrived in the city of Antioch, they shared the gospel among themselves, mostly Jewish diaspora folks. But then Luke, the writer of the book of Acts, clearly mentioned there were few people from Cyrene and Cyprus who shared the gospel with the Greeks, the Gentiles. And soon, gospel takes root and it begins to expand uh, beyond that. That is the Syrian Orthodox Church in Antioch, Syria today. So let's look at who were the Christians in the city of Antioch. We see in Jerusalem, Christians were largely Jewish folks. They maintained Torah, they read scripture, there was no New Testament at that time. They kept Sabbath, they required circumcision for their boys. And so it was very Jewish in nature. It was a sect of Jewish, uh, Judaism as Christianity began. But in Antioch, there were Gentiles. And they become an oral gospel and the story of resurrection of Jesus take root and many, many followed. And Christianity moved from Sabbath Saturday to Sunday morning, worshipping the resurrection and the risen Christ. A re relocation to a new place also created confusion of identity. A geographical and generational displacement and the gospel advances when people move from place to place. We see this expanding ripple of the gospel. From Jerusalem, now it is taking root in Antioch, and that becomes a center and the activity of Christianity. Just a few decades, Jerusalem was center, and soon it diffused to other places and continues to grow to the ends of the earth. And so it is here, from Jerusalem, it began to spread. Gentile Christians. So we see that finally the news about the new Christian, the Gentile Christian in Antioch, it reach, uh, reach uh, the people in Jerusalem. Verse 22, Barnabas was sent, Barnabas himself was a Cyprian, and he was sent to Antioch, go check out these new believers, and scripture tells that they reached there, and they found the believers, and he was greatly encouraged, Barnabas' name is son of encouragement, he lived up to his name, and he found the new believers, he was full of the spirit, and it's in sync with what the spirit was doing in this new town, the Christians who were doing their faith, Christianity in a new way. Verse 24, he was full of the Holy Spirit. He was a Levite from Cyprus. Uh, for chapter 4, verse 36. The evidence of God's grace was evident on the Gentile Christian, and he encouraged them to stay true. But because of this Gentile Christianity, they needed a new identity, and there it was in verse 26 says, it was here at Antioch, they were called Christians for the first time. Christian simply means Christios, Messiah, 
Ayanos, that simply means belonging. People belonging to Christ, being like Jesus in that land. So once Christianity moved beyond the ethnic, nationalistic, and social classes, they needed a brand new identity. Uh, Christ displacement often creates a, a crisis of identity and belonging and loyalty to a man beyond all our nations and all the other allegiances. The man Jesus, he is a universal savior. All people, all tongues confess him as savior. All knees bow before him. So it was Antioch, the name Christian was assigned to the followers of Jesus. Those who belong to Jesus and who belong and look like Jesus to the world around them. Diasporic displacement creates challenge of identity and ultimate allegiance. And that's what we see happening here in the city of Antioch. Let's briefly compare the Christians in Jerusalem and Christians in Antioch. Christianity began in Jerusalem around AD 30. Uh, but a decade later, it began in Antioch. The founder of Christianity in Jerusalem was Peter. But in Antioch, it was diaspora Jews. The leadership was largely apostles. But in, uh, in Antioch, it was lay Christian. A couple of chapters later in Acts chapter 13, it lists actually the name of the elders of the church in Antioch. Number one, it was Barnabas. Barnabas was a Jew. He was from Cyprus. Number two, Saul. Saul was a Jew from Tarsus, Asia Minor. Then we see a third person is Simeon the Niger. Niger simply means black. That means he is from the sub-Saharan African region. Number four, a Manian, who was a foster brother of Herod the Antipas, the Tetrarch of Galilee. Herod, Herodian dynasty ruled Palestine at that time. A Palestinian who grew up in the household of a king. That represent a cultured elite people of the society. High class, wealthy, and powerful. And fifth person was Lucius the Cyrene from North Africa. That is also in, in, in Africa. So it means that two out of five were from Africa. One Middle Easterner and one from Asia Minor. The diversity that is evident in the leadership of the church in Antioch. Whereas in Jerusalem it was largely apostle all of them Jew. So we see that uh, Christianity is undergoing a transformation as a result of displacement as about new Christians joining the group. We see language also underwent a change. It was largely Hebrew and Aramaic in Jerusalem, but in Antioch was Hellenization. After the Alexander the Great, the Greek became the language of the diaspora, and much of that was written, much of that was said in Antioch was all in Greek. No wonder New Testament is written in Greek. And we see Old Testament getting translated into Greek in Alexandria, not in Jerusalem. So this is the diaspora factor of the spread of Christianity. It is always coloring outside the circle and Christianity gained momentum and mobility and motion within it. We see they met in their homes. Now it is moved outside into the marketplace, synagogues and as well as homes. The center of Christianity, Jerusalem was the center. Now periphery has become the new center. So we say mag migra my margins becomes the new center of Christianity only to establish new margins while the old ones wanes. So we see the attitude of Christianity, Christians in the early part was ethnocentric. And they largely kept the faith to themselves, fearing persecution uh, from the ruling authorities. Because they had just killed the master a decade ago and they continued to struggle uh, in early, early, years, or early years of the Christianity. Uh, but in Antioch, they had the freedom and they invited people who are unlike themselves. So we see Christianity growing in Antioch. And by AD 70, 40 years down the road, Christianity is destroyed in Jerusalem, where Antioch continues to flourish, establishing churches all over the Mediterranean world. And so we see the spread of Christianity along the lines of the diaspora trajectories. So we say the Jewish diaspora framed the trajectory of growth and expansion. Likewise, today's diaspora are on the forefront and the spread and the growth of Christianity. So some lessons from the Antiochian church for us today. What does it mean to be a welcoming congregation, especially those who are in the margins of society? Antiochian church had compassion, generosity, openness, a welcoming spirit. As a result, these persecuted Christians from Jerusalem, Cyprus, all over North Africa, they were welcoming congregation across ethnic, racial, and national lines. 
uh, become being a cosmopolitan center. Embraces diversity and grow in intercultural skills and understanding. The church was getting globalized in a way. The church in Antioch, unlike the church in, 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 in Jerusalem. They were committed to the truth and learned continually from the best teacher. Soon after Barnabas reaches there and finds these new believers, Barnabas being a good Levite, a priestly man and a godly man, a spirit-filled man, he merely sends the need. These new believers need some good teaching and I know exactly the guy they need. And he travels all the way to Tarsus and fetches him and brings him to Antioch and makes him the teaching pastor of the new church. And Paul taught from the scripture. And people just grew. One whole year, he taught them. Early Christians were not just meeting on Sundays. They met every day. And here is Paul with all his wisdom, his recent conversion. He is committed to teaching them the ways of the Lord. The people were discipled, nurtured in the faith, and grew in their faith. And then soon we see they were kind enough when Paul, uh, Paul senses the mission far beyond Antioch. They support him and sends him. It was a mission sending church in Antioch. The church in Jerusalem was inward looking, fear of persecution, kept it to themselves. And here is a church. I sometimes wonder if I was the elder committee or the executive committee of the church in Antioch, I wouldn't let Paul go. I will hold on to such a wonderful pastor that we got. And every day sit and seeing the people grow in their faith and be revived as a church. But here is a church in Antioch. They readily let Paul go. What does it mean as Grace Chapel to send your very best for the cause of mission far beyond the coast of Boston? Catching a global vision and sending your very best for the frontiers. Who are your Pauls? the next generation, young men and women, who will be part of God's work far beyond the shores of America. Celebrate unity with the new name and the new sense of belonging beyond ethnicity and religious backgrounds. What does it mean? What is this unity across heterogeneous reality? For many years, we kept homogeneity as the primary mission focus and how we build churches and establish churches. But now we say it is heterogeneous unity principle, the new heterogeneous paradigm. What does it mean to embrace diversity and establish a unity that beyond the skin color and ethnic roots and historic uh, ancestral backgrounds? So what does it mean for a church to become truly global church? When Christianity grew in Europe, they brought people from Europe. Then we saw people from Latin America uh, coming into America. And then we saw the African it was the slave wave, but they established the African stream of Christianity here in America. And for the last many decades, uh, Christians were, not, and uh, people from Asia was not allowed. And in the 1965 immigration reform changed that, and we see a stream of Asian Christianity. Every stream of Christianity from different continents have come. Where Christianity grows, it pushes its people out, and they go to places. America is an immigrant nation. American Christianity is diasporic Christianity is in plural. Every stream of Christians from different, different shores of the world have come to America, has uniquely revived and strengthened and re-engaged with the world. American Christianity is constantly changing because where Christianity grows, they send their people here because America is a welcoming place. What does it mean beyond the political rhetorics and the media portrayal to understand the refugees, the asylum seekers, immigrants who are coming, how they uniquely contribute to our economy and build our nation and continue to celebrate a spirit of welcoming and kingdom spirit, I say. A Revelation 7, 9 vision that we're a great multitude that no one can number from every nation, from every language and every peoples of the world. If that is the heavenly vision, God is bringing people from around the world to here to the American shore, so that globalize the American church that will be more ready for heaven. Heaven is not going to be a place, I don't imagine it to be a place where if you have American passport, go there to that corner. If you have a, uh, you, if your color of the skin is such and such, you go to such a place. Um, uh, there's no difference distinguishing. It is only the, the savior, uh, the risen savior, that we all are who are clothed uh, in the white robes 
and who are washed by the blood of Christ will together stand and bow down before. That's the heavenly reality. And as migrants who are coming to America, God is discipling us, nurturing us, giving us the opportunity to build relationship so that together we'll be ready for heaven. And finally, what does it mean to establish unity across differences? And finally, leaders provide encouragement and fill the gaps in ministry with other leaders. A sense of collaborative spirit that I see in the church in Antioch. But before that, I want to kind of, uh, you know, see this uh, larger two Greek words. One is diaspora, the other is ecclesia. Diaspora simply means scattering uh, or dispersion. Uh, first used in the Septuagint in the Old Testament translation into Greek. Uh, uh, but subsequently we see many, many references to the word diaspora in the New Testament, established especially the growth of the church. The second word is ecclesia. That simply means gathering or assembly. And it's often translated as the church. God scatters people. The scattered one he gathers. The gathered one are once again scattered on his mission. To understand God's work in the world through people of the, God's people from all over the world. God scatters his people and he gathers one. We all from across the Boston suburbs have gathered together this Sunday morning for the special Sunday of the year. For Global Awareness Week. How much more globally aware are we? with our brothers and sisters. If there are Christians in every country of the world, you and I need to have a relationship and friendship with peoples of the world. An African theologian once said, if you belong to Christ, you belong to everyone who belong to Christ. Let me repeat that. If you belong to Christ, you belong to everyone who belong to Christ. This is the Ubuntu spirit, African spirit, community orientation. Sometimes in North America, we reduce the gospel into a consumeristic, individualistic perspective. We belong to the global church. If there are Christians in every country of the world, you and I need to know every Christian from around the world. God scatters people. All the scattered ones who are coming to America, almost two-thirds of them are Christians. You and I have an obligation to welcome them to, into our neighborhoods, into our, into our churches. Gather them and to establish new sense of more global we are, more globally connected more globally informed and more globally aware and more globally relevant and needed we will be. Gathering and scattering is how we understand the church. And this Sunday afternoon, after the church is over, you're going to be scattered again into every neighborhood, every school and college and, and neighborhoods across Boston. And you are continuing to be a missionary as you go to your workplaces this week. And then, once again, God is going to gather you next Sunday. To tell the stories of God, God is doing in, through you and around you. And then once again celebrate, learn and grow only to be scattered again. So the scattering and gathering is the twin DNA structure of the church in mission in the world. John Stott, one of the founders of the Lausanne movement, I'm sure he must have been here in Boston. But he used to say, we must be global Christian with a global vision because our God is a global God. What does it mean for us to become global Christian? And may Global uh, Awareness Week make us more global this year and this Sunday than last Sunday or last year. What does it mean to know that if the church is truly global and God is doing mission from everywhere to everywhere? But some of you may ask, why do I need a, a Christian from Africa to come? We need Christians from Africa to come and save us. Save us how? We've been doing missions in Africa and Latin America for decades. But these Christians who are coming from Africa and Asia and Latin America are coming to save us. Save us from a narrow, parochial and ethnicized, racialized, politicized view of Christianity. And to truly embrace a global vision, a kingdom vision, where that includes all people everywhere, all ages, all races and all cultures and all languages. Let's celebrate diversity. Let's celebrate and understand how God is scattering. As Acts 17, verse 26 says, is the God who determines the place and the time where I should live. Those who have made it through the, through the uh, wall and southern border, or those who have made it through the airports at Logan and JFK and Chicago or here, we must recognize that God has brought them here. Just like God brought ancestors, our forefathers to America. All of us are migrants or descendants of migrants here in America. And Christian faith revives and constantly is revived 
through migration. And so we see the story of Christianity through migration, dispersion, and gathering. And I had the good fortune to travel across Europe and many, many refugee centers across Europe a few years ago, also in Middle East and Africa. I was amazed at hundreds of new churches by the believers from the war-torn regions of Iraq and Syria and Afghanistan and Turkey. God is doing something in the midst of the greatest humanitarian crisis. God is moving people. The political orders of Venezuela and the debacle that we have seen in Southern America and how people have reached, gone to Europe and North America in many unique ways are reviving Christianity. So God is on the move. God is not static. Static gods are idols. Idols are territorial and oppressive. Our God is a living God. God of the Bible is a living God. And God is on the move. And we say Mothers Day, just like Missio Day. Last 60 years, Missio Day was a major mission idea. Now we say Mothers, God is moving. Because people are moving. People moving, people see God as a moving God. And so understanding of the Antiochian church model, a set of refugees and immigrants who at the face of persecution and economic disruptions have landed in the city of Antioch and how Christianity revived and re-engaged with the world and Christianity moved to Europe and North Africa and Asia. And so this is the story. God is on the move, Christians are on the move and God's kingdom advances and now it has reached the ends of the earth and is bringing back with new thrust and new momentum. What does it mean to be on mission with God? Each one of you is not some, mission is not a line item in the budget of the church. Mission is not something that I do once in a year on a special Sunday with special programming. Mission is that all of God's people are on mission with God in the world. So what does it mean for all of us to get on mission to every neighborhood, every sector of the society, every, uh, every uh, circle of influence that you have? Uh, don't just limit to professionals like us who do this full time as teachers, as pastors, as professors. What does it mean for all of us to get on a mission? May uh, uh, the Grace Chapel, every member in every campus understand that we are on mission with God. Christianity is a giveaway faith. When we give it away to other people, when they see the transformation, this gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ brings about in the people's life. I think we'll have a greater conviction about this faith uh, for ourselves. May we this week uh, encourage us. May we be commissioned on this Sunday to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. And the people who are coming from the ends of the earth to your neighborhoods, welcome them and learn new facets of this faith. And may we be continually be on mission. Understand the scattering and the gathering of the people. And in this dynamics is where church grows, faith is revived and we re-engage with the world. Thank you very much. Blessings on you. It was a great to be here. I look forward to interacting with you. Sonda-me, Senhor, e me conheces. Quebranta o meu coração. Transforma-me conforme a tua palavra E enche-me até que em mim se ache só a ti E então Usa-me, Senhor Usa-me como um farol que brilha a noite como ponte sobre as águas Como abrigo no deserto Como flecha que acerta o alvo Eu quero ser usado Da maneira que te agrada Em qualquer hora e em qualquer lugar Eis aqui a minha vida Usa-me, Senhor Usa-me Sonda-me, Senhor, e me conheces Quebranta o meu coração Transforma 
me conforme a tua palavra e enche-me até que em mim se ache só a ti então usa-me Senhor Sim, usa-me como um farol que brilha a noite Como um ponte sobre as águas Como um abrigo no deserto Como um flecha que acerta o alvo Eu quero ser usado da maneira que te agrada Em qualquer hora, em qualquer lugar Eis aqui a minha vida, usa-me, Senhor, usa-me, sonda-me, quebranta-me, transforma-me, enche-me e usa-me, sonda-me. Quebranta-me, transforma-me, enche-me e usa-me, Senhor. Como um farol que brilha à noite, como ponte sobre as águas, como abrigo do deserto. Como flecha que acerta o alvo Eu quero ser usado da maneira Que te agrada em qualquer hora e em qualquer lugar Eis aqui a minha vida, usa-me, Senhor Usa-me Thank you so much for joining us for the special Global Awareness Sunday. Bye, everybody.